session. And uh, the next session is going to be given by Jonathan Bellinkoff on localization and language models. And uh, we were a little late, and therefore you get another 15 minutes. We just shifted everything by 15 right. minutes. So in the schedule it says 12.15 for lunch, but it's actually 12.30. Okay. I'm going to go first and pass the Yeah, hopefully um, you're not going to get too hungry <laughs> by the end of this uh, talk. So, um, um, yeah, I'm a faculty member of the Technion. I'm actually staying uh, at, uh, in Boston this summer uh, visiting David Bao uh, from Northeastern University. So I'll, I'll be talking about some of our joint work and also some of uh, some other work that we've been doing on localizing information and other uh, types of knowledge, various types of knowledge in, uh, in language models. Um, so in this workshop, we've seen a bunch of different problems with language models, things like reasoning, planning, issues of uh, fairness, bias, toxicity, um, problems with factuality and grounding. We'll hear more about that in the afternoon, I believe, uh, from Jacob. And uh, just recently, issues of privacy and copyright. So initially, I had uh, multiple slides demonstrating all these uh, problems, but you all know about that. Um, so I can just remind uh, some of the audience that, that there have been talks that showed some of these issues. So in Yejin's talk on the first day, she showed this nice example. You can uh, prompt GPT, say, um, suppose it takes three hours to dry a shirt and five hours to dry a pair of pants in the sun. How long would it take to dry um, two shirts? And, and the model is very confused. That doesn't really get it, okay? Um, yesterday we, had, we heard uh, Adam uh, talking about uh, issues of bias a bit. So he had this nice example also with GPT-4. Um, you ask it uh, in the sentence, the nurse married a doctor because she was pregnant. Who is pregnant? And the model says it's, uh, she refers to the nurse. So the nurse is pregnant and you could ask them all why, why it thinks this way. Well, it says that it's biologically impossible for a male doctor to be pregnant. So, so you can see the bias uh, in, in these uh, responses. And these issues are very prevalent. Um, let me show you another example. So here's a question I asked uh, uh, GPT a while ago. Who was awarded a Nobel Peace Prize in uh, 1948? By the way, does anyone know the, the answer here? Anyone wants to guess? No guesses. No wrong answers. Well, all wrong Winston answers. Winston Churchill. Churchill. Yeah. Why? Why Churchill? They were reapportioning the world about that point. <laughs> okay, so no, no guesses. So here, <laughs> what's that? Churchill, Churchill won a literature prize, didn't he? Yeah, I believe so. Um, so here's uh, here's GPT's answer, and people can try online with their favorite model as we go along. So the Nobel Peace Prize was awarded to the UN Commission on Human Rights, according to GPT. Um, and if you ask it why, why it got this award this year, it would give you a very convincing answer. It was awarded for the promotion of universal respect and observance of human rights and fundamental freedoms for all and so on and so forth. Um, except that it's false, it's completely uh, wrong. And the truth is that there was no, no Nobel Prize awarded uh, this year, okay? Uh, anyone knows why? So it was supposed to go to Gandhi, apparently. Um, that was the plan. But um, unfortunately, he was murdered just shortly before they uh, awarded the prize. Okay, so uh, models make uh, make up stuff, right, uh, all the time. So we have these problems. What could we do about it? Well, um, we could try to retrain them, collect more data, uh, better data, clean it, filter it, and so on. That, that's very expensive and costly uh, to do. And it might not help with some of these issues like bias and, and other types of assumptions that... Uh, models make. Um, and you might say, well, now we have these uh, kind of ways to align models to what, uh, what we want them to do, like our late chef, and these things, well, they're, they're, they're good and useful, but it's not enough. Um, we recently put uh, a preprint on, on uh, problems that arise when you do these procedures of uh, instruction tuning or RLHF uh, for models, and somehow they exhibit even more bias in certain types of decision making. Um, so instead, I'm going to advocate for a, a different approach or a complementary uh, approach, which is to actually look inside these models and figure out what's going on inside. So we're going to do something kind of like brain surgery for uh, language models. Okay, they, 
The goals would be to figure out the internal computation that happens in these uh, models and then perform some fine-grained interventions in the models to perhaps change their behavior in uh, a, a desired way. Okay, that's kind of the state of mind. Um, and some of you might be skeptical. Uh, just an hour ago, uh, I think uh, Jonathan Frankel made a comment that uh, here I'm, I'm paraphrasing with something like, it's hopeless to look inside the, the black box. Uh, that, that's perhaps a fair ob objection. It's a very large model, complicated, hard to look inside, and some of these models are not even available. And still, I hope to convince you today that some, something can be done, and it's, to some extent, it's uh, possible. Okay? Good. Um, so before we dive into the details, I want to go back in time a bit to one of those periods of uh, AI winters uh, that, uh, that we've had in the 1980s. Uh, at that point in time, there was a big debate in the AI and cognitive science community, um, sometimes known as the localist versus distributed debate. Who's familiar here with this uh, debate? Yeah, quite a few people. Great. So um, there were all these uh, papers on what is a good uh, way to represent knowledge in, uh, in systems. Should it be distributed representations or localist representations, the connectionists folks versus the symbolist uh, uh, folks that came up with a lot of uh, arguments and, uh, about uh, which of these is, uh, is good and why. So I'm going to uh, define what it means or show you some example of what it means right now. Okay, so what are distributed versus localist representations? Uh, some uh, definitions, a localist representation is such where there is one computing element per uh, each entity or concept. So a uh, computing element, you can think of a neuron in an artificial neural network, or it might be something else. Um, and entities could be concepts, objects, things that you want to uh, talk about. In a distributed representation, each entity is represented by multiple computing uh, elements, and on the other hand, uh, and each computing element might be involved in representing uh, many different uh, entities. Okay. And these, these terms, these um, uh, properties sometimes show up in different terms in different fields. So you might know them in, uh, under some different names that I'm not going to talk about. Um, okay, but this is coming from the PDP people, the Parallel Distributed Processing people in, in their paper in 1986. Um, uh, yeah, uh, this group of people. Okay, so to make it a little more clear, is a vi here's a visual uh, illustration of this. Here we have a world that's made of shapes. They have different colors, uh, circles, triangles, squares, and here's some way to represent them in a um, system. Uh, so we have the rows are different units, okay? And um, each unit, as you can see, corresponds to just one uh, object, one shape. So you can see this by this diagonal. Okay, um, so we have a particular unit for a white circle or another particular unit for a green uh, triangle. Okay. Um, so notice that the number of, because there's this one-to-one -one mapping, the number of units is equal to the number of uh, 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 concepts. Um, in a distributed representation, that might look uh, quite different. Same world, fewer units, and units are not so clear. It doesn't always uh, make sense at what they do. So if you look at this unit, it activates on some objects. Uh, I don't know what they mean. Maybe they have no uh, meaning. Sometimes they kind of make sense. Here's a unit that activates on things that are not circles, sort of, approximately. Um, so things to note is that it's more compact, uh, but on the other hand, hard to interpret what's going on inside. Is it, isn't it ironic if Hinton and Rommelhard and so forth were on the side of localism? No, the, 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 no, they were on the distributed Yeah, side. they were on the distributed oh, thank side. You, thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks for this clarification. Right, thank you. Yeah. Um, and of course, things are not uh, binary. You could have semi-distributed, semi-localist uh, representations. So it's kind of like a spectrum. So you notice we have slightly more units here, and we kind of can understand what they do. It's not exactly a one-to-one -one mapping, but here's, for instance, one that is um, triangle or square. Okay. So there's a, perhaps a, a spectrum. Okay, so um, distributed representations, pros and cons to, to these. These are coming from uh, this uh, literature from the 1980s and, and 90s. They are told to be efficient. Um, they're con usually continuous representations, and that means they have this nice quality of uh, graceful degradation. If you add noise, it doesn't completely de destroy the, the system's behavior. 
Unfortunately, they're less uh, interpretable. Um, localist representations are said to be easier to work with. And uh, that, that's perhaps questionable, but that's something people say. And uh, they're more interpretable. OK, so does the debate make sense? OK, who won this debate? As, as you know, yeah, the, the, the distributed representations uh, kind of took over. They work really well. The models are super large. Uh, things seem to be distributed uh, everywhere. So we might question if it's even reasonable to look for localized information in, in modern uh, AI models or language models in, uh, in particular. Um, and that may seem surprising on first uh, thought. But in fact, for a very long time, people have been seeing these, this structure in, in uh, neural networks. So already in the 90s, Elman had this work on uh, recurrent neural networks, finding structure in models that do something like predicting the next word in a, in a sentence. Okay? Um, a few years ago, um, people from OpenAI had uh, trained a, a model on uh, movie reviews. And they were able to find one neuron that seems to uh, be like a sentiment neuron. So it activates in some uh, way on positive sentiment reviews and other way on negative sentiment reviews. And they have these nice examples. Here's a movie review that starts positive, uh, talking about the best intentions, but then switch to some negative uh, words like most scenes are identic, not that funny, not that well done. And you can see the activation of the, of the neuron changes gradually throughout the course of this uh, sentence. Um, these things show up very clearly in very well-structured texts. So if you train a language model on uh, code, you will see uh, neurons that do things like identify if you're an if, an if statement, okay, an if statement detector, um, and various other functionalities. So th these, these things can be detected and have been detected for, for a while. Um, I also want to make the point that many uh, of the uh, patterns that we see are not easily interpretable to humans. So if you try to find some pattern here, good luck. It's probably going to be very uh, difficult. And I'm making this point because in the interpretability community, we have a tendency to kind of highlight the positive findings and sometimes forget that there are many negative uh, cases where we can't really figure out what's going on. So I think that's important to keep uh, in mind. Cool. Um, so here are the questions for this talk. One is, can we find uh, localized, uh, localized information? And two is, can we control the network's behavior if we do find this localized uh, information? And uh, to give you like a preview, uh, to some extent, the answer would be yes, we can find some information. And the tool is going to be to perform interventions, causal interventions. And uh, can we control the network's behavior? To some extent, we can. And we're going to do that by editing models, meaning we're going to change model weights in a very fine-grained uh, manner. OK. All good so far? Yeah. One question is operationally. Uh, do you, does it matter how you define localized versus distributed? Like how, how many neurons, how many uh, does it need to be uh, distributed over to be localized? Thousands, but you might consider how it actually scales with the size of the problem in terms of whether it stays. Yeah, I think, I think the question, if I understand correctly, is about the right granularity to study the, the problem. Should we look at individual neurons or many of them or multiple of them? Um, is, that, is that your point? Is there, in, in your experiments, is there going to be a clear distinction between what is localized and what is distributed? Because it might be. It's a matter of like how, how many is many. Oh, it's a matter, yeah. So I guess the, the question is if there's a clear cut division between localized and distributed, and, and the answer is no. Um, the things are, might be gradual, and uh, there's a spectrum of, of these. So I think we will see some cases where you can pinpoint neurons. Other cases, it would be let's focus on one layer. So a layer is perhaps a thousand neurons. Um, or in other cases, it might be an attention head. So uh, it varies. But in any case, it's going to be much, much orders of magnitude fewer parameters than the full size of the, of the model. Cool. All right. Um, so here's a motivating example of how this, uh, this work could, uh, could go. Um, these are two prompts to a language model. The nurse said that, and the doctor said that. As you might imagine, if we feed it 
this to some model. It generates texts, uh, which uh, um, the nurse prompt leads to some uh, text about the woman, uh, and the doctor uh, prompt leads to some text about the a man. Okay, so that that's not new. The question is, what in the model, what in the model's computation causes this uh, bias, this gender bias, to arise? Um, and what we're going to do uh, to reveal that is to define some intervention. So here's my uh, sketch of a model. It gets, gets this uh, prompt, the nurse said that, and then it needs to predict the next word. So what, did it, what does it do? It computes a probability. In particular, I could uh, look at a probability ratio, how likely it's going to output he versus she. If this is going to be uh, very low, then uh, that means that uh, the model is quite biased to think that nurse uh, is, a, is a female. Um, so we have this measure. And now we're going to perform uh, this intervention. Uh, we're going to change the input from a nurse, which is a, um, a, a, an ambiguous uh, word, uh, to uh, the word man, which is like a prototypical um, gender-specific uh, word. And we're going to run the, this example through the model. And now probably it's going to be assigned a very high probability to he, a very low probability to she. And then we can measure the difference in this probability ratios and that's going to be the effect, the causal effect that we're going to uh, get. Okay. Um, so that's not really looking inside models. You could do this with uh, uh, chat with GPT-4 through the web interface. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to look at uh, intermediate nodes in this computation graph, and we're going to change the uh, behavior of intermediate nodes. So we actually run this these two examples, and then we run a third time through the model. But this time, if you look at the, the right-hand side, we uh, freeze one uh, particular node to the activation or the behavior it would have had had the prompt been the, the alternative one. Okay, So it's a counterfactual outcome. And what this is meant to show us, it's meant to break this effect of the intervention to two components. There's a direct effect that flows from the uh, input to the output, and there's the indirect effect that flows through a particular intermediate variable. Um, these, these intermediate variables are known as mediators in the causal inference uh, literature. And um, I think the, the major paper that introduced this framework is by uh, Judah Pearl in 2001, talking about direct and indirect effects. So intuitively, what this is meant to capture is how important is this particular node, one neuron, say, to uh, the prediction of the model in a way that causes it to, to be biased. And now if we have this, in, uh, this set up, then the line of attack is going to be exhaustively go through all of the model components, each time, each time do this intervention, continue running, measure, aggregate over many examples, and get some uh, number to show which components are more important than others. Okay. Make sense? Okay. Um, so each time we're making one change and then rolling back. Yeah, you, you could ask about cumulative effects, which we have done, but it's a little more complicated. So if we do this over many components, what we see normally is this kind of sparse looking behavior. So this is a, a model from the GPT-2 uh, family, and we're showing here on the y-axis different layers, on the axis is different attention heads. If you're familiar with those, fine. If not, it's not so important, some component inside the transformer uh, model. And uh, the darker the color, the stronger the effect. So what I want you to take out from this uh, picture is that there are only a few components that have a high, a, a strong color. And things are quite, this, uh, quite sparse or quite localized, one could say. And, and this picture is not um, a typical. So if we repeat this to many, uh, many models, then we always get these kind of... Uh, Parse looking uh, pictures. Okay, so information about gender bias seems to be localized in these models in certain uh, components. Okay, um, and if you want to read more, this is uh, work done with uh, Jesse Vig and Sebastian uh, German and, uh, and a few other uh, uh, colleagues a couple of years ago. Yes, is it possible that like only a few units? Yes, I think the, the question is if uh, it's possible that there's redundancy in the, in, in the information. And uh, 
we're not seeing this over many units because there are other units that kind of fulfill their role. Yes, it is possible, and you could look into that by um, finding subsets of, of uh, units that are responsible, which we have done. It's a little challenging computationally because to, to look at all the possible subsets is, is in, intractable. Um, we do have in this paper approximate algorithms to, to do this uh, in a, a kind of a greedy way. And uh, you do see units that go together. Um, it's also interesting to do some qualitative analysis and see how their behavior differs, but I'm not going to go into this. Yes. So I, I know some people don't like this, but if we kind of map this to like an old school like n-gram mod, it seems like it, it, one could imagine this as something like, for example, you look at the bigrams, and then the bigram, his husband, is much more rare than her husband. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, that information is also very localized. But it's localized maybe in a not that exciting way, right? So it, are, is, I guess, I, I guess I, my, my question is like how, how it, do you see this as being something much more exciting than basically like just counting bigrams, you, you know, some sort of generalized bigrams? I mean, big question. Um... I don't know that I want to go into the debate on whether transformers are just uh, higher order n-gram models. Seems like we're not going to get out of that so much. Um, so let me just say at this point that I, I do think that there is something more than just counting n-grams, but I, I'd rather not open it for like a, a long discussion. Well, yeah, I I, I, apart from that, yeah. it, I, is, 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 I, I, is that... Is this sparsity you think it can basically be able to control many other things? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. So, so, yeah. So, I mean, depends on the, the problem that you study. And some might be well approximated by bigrams and some not. Maybe I'll show another example in a moment. Yeah. Okay. Yes. I mean, about that question, it seems that even the if statement example that we saw earlier, um, what is sitting inside of the if statement is not conducive to particular bigrams in the code. Yeah, you need global context, you need to so, remember the opening, closing plan. Yeah, so so what, I'm, what I'm learning from this so far is that, uh, you know, the original uh, contrast that you did between localized and distributed word representation was actually a lot about just the word being the local thing. So whereas the later examples like sentiment analysis or if statement, it's more about the abstract concept that was not necessarily localized into a particular angle. Yeah, that's an interesting point. I mean, some of these uh, neurons do things that are very low level word detectors, bigram detectors. I mean, people have tried to catalog them and you can see these very, very simple things. And others are more sophisticated, high order concepts that, that arise. So it kind of it runs the gamut of the linguistic complexity. Yeah. Any other questions? Cool. Uh, okay, so we kind of find the information um, localized. Can we do something about that? Okay, so here's the hypothesis. The hypothesis is that we can, if we can trace the internal mechanism in these models, we should be able to change uh, their behavior, okay, in some desired way. And to go into this, I want to switch to a, a, a slightly different setting about um, locating factual knowledge. So as you know, these models have a lot of knowledge about the world. You can prompt them with things like uh, these triples of subject, relation, objects. You can prompt them all asking, Brian De Palma works in the area of, and it would complete it with film, or Miles Davis plays the trumpet, and so on. There's a lot of these um, relations that are encoded in these, uh, in these models. So we've looked into uh, this question of factual knowledge, and other people have also done that. And we again try to trace where in the model this knowledge is stored. You can do something very similar to the mediation analysis that I, uh, that I showed you. I'm not going to go through the technicalities of how to do that, but it's very similar. And you get this kind of uh, figure. So in this figure, I'm showing you this effect of predicting, completing the correct uh, uh, word. In this case, that uh, Prime De Palma uh, works in uh, film. Um, and the x-axis are different layers in one of these models. And on the y-axis, you see the different words or tokens in the sentence. And the darker color means that 
there's some strong effect there uh, when we perform the intervention there. And uh, interestingly, there are two kind of sites where you see strong effects. Now, one of them is not so interesting. At the late site, that's where things are going to, the model is going to output uh, a prediction. So if you change something there, if you copy activations from another uh, input there, that's not so surprising. It's like you replace the entire uh, input. But the surprising part is this early site, which comes quite early in some intermediate um, layer. And, and this is on one example, but you can do this over many examples and you get these uh, figures. You could do this for different components, hidden states, uh, MLPs and attention uh, heads. And it kind of, it's, there are some differences, but it's kind of uh, similar. We always have these two sites. Um, what, what does the dark color mean? It means that intervention makes a big difference. Makes a big difference, yeah. It means that it's, after intervention, it changes its prediction of film. Intervention meaning replacement by what? Meaning re that's uh, replacement by um, activations or outputs of layers from one, and run, one run to another run. Yeah. Um, and the thing that I want to highlight is that there are these middle network uh, layers, in particular one component, which, is the M which are the MLPs, have very strong uh, effects. So our, our interpretation uh, to that is that at the late site, that's what the model is going to say what it wants to say. Um, but in the early site, that's where knowledge is stored. That's where knowing effect uh, is happening. Okay, so that's a human interpretation to these, uh, these results. Um, so basically, when, when it sees Brian De Palma, then it, it loads in the information that he works in film in case it might be needed later. Exactly, exactly. So it kind of prepares yeah. to the occasion that it might be, get asked about that, right? And you might ask a lot of questions about how this happens, that it, it loads the information and, 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 and get, gets ready to answer this question if it might arise. Yeah, I'll show something about that in a moment. Yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't understand the definition. A site is a neuron, and what does early and late mean? A, a site in this case is, um, uh, is not a neuron, it's uh, a full uh, layer Okay. In this, case, in this particular case. So it's an early layer versus er, layer. early means yes. Early means earlier in the computation of the model, and later means later in the computation of the model. So instead of site, if I put in layer, yeah, you could just say layer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that that would be good. Okay. And also saying it, you mean being able to compute with just output the, the the token, output the word. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yes. So earlier it was he versus she, so you had p he versus over p she. Now it's just P-film over like one minus P-film or did you Yeah, technically it's, it's just P-film that because the setting that we're using is a little different rather than you comparing two prompts, we're adding noise and denoising. So once you denoise, if you can predict film, that's good. Yeah, that's, that's a technicality. Yeah. So here on the, on the picture you have like the further warped layer, right? I guess it's like several layers. You mean that it's spread? Are you asking about this being spread? Uh, no, but like, yeah, so basically you have like three inches there, like and two, like the first and the last of them for one board and the middle one for several boards. Um, I'm not sure I understand. So, so are you talking about... It's like a, a, the vertical axis. Yeah, yeah. vertical axis, <laughs> so it's, easy, it's easier to see here. Vertical axis here is uh, yeah, yeah, just words. Yeah, here I'm abstracting over a thousand examples. So the examples come in with different lengths and different structures, so I need to do something different. So I'm showing everything that's before. Um, the, I'm showing the, this entity, like Brian De Palma. So there's the last token of this entity, and then I'm separately showing things that are before that last token and things that are after that last token. Yes, but so but how did you change the middle token? Did you change all of them simultaneously? I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm changing each each time. I'm only changing activations corresponding to one particular token. Yeah. But I mean, so so another question is, would the impact be more significant if you like change not like a random token in, in the middle, but like next to last one? Next to sorry. So would the Impact be as big as changing the last token if it was not the last token but next to last token. Well, I mean, you, you, you see that, 
yeah, but here you average over. over yeah, over, 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 over multiple, but usually words have two tokens or three. That, and the answer is no. It's very, it's a very low impact. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, so uh, let's uh, move on. So what do we know so far? Middle layers store this uh, knowledge. And uh, there's other work that's showing, talking about Scott's uh, question of how this knowledge gets enriched or, or loaded. They talked about subject enrichment and then extraction, kind of a very complicated uh, process. And you might ask uh, how this uh, procedure happens. Um, I'm not going to go into details, but in some very recent work, we found out that for some kind of this factual recall, you can approximate a very complicated computation. This is perhaps many layers of nonlinear uh, functions. You can approximate that with a linear function. So I could replace this complicated computation with some linear transformation and get the correct prediction in, uh, in, in many cases, which is kind of weird. I mean, this, this could be 10 or 15 layers that we replace, 10 or 15 blocks that we're replacing. Um, and we have some particular way to find this, uh, uh, this uh, linear transformation, but that seems to work in, in many cases. So it, while we think these models are very uh, highly nonlinear deep models in some cases, they are actually performing a simple linear computation. Is Wait, there a question in the back? Yeah, so this is just on one piece of text, right? So then it's not so surprising that it's in a linear way. Um, not, so that's not exactly the statement. The, the statement that we're, we're going to make, uh, that we're making here is we can find a transformation that works for many pieces of text. A linear transformation that works well for many pieces of text. Many random pieces or related pieces? Related. That's actually, so that's a good point. In fact, in particular, we looked at different kind of relations. And for some of them, this linear approximation is great. And for others, it's bad. So it actually matters if you're asking about uh, a person's, uh, a company headquarters, or if you're asking about the, a country's capital city. Now, I can't really make a sense out of when this works well, this linear approximation works well, and when it doesn't. It just happens to be that some relations are well approximated as a linear transformation and some aren't. But are, are these different linear functions for each of these or the same? Yeah, yeah those, are di those are different linear functions for each of these. Those so are like the best we could find for each of so them. So it's a non-linear function that has many, many restrictions that are linear. Fine. Yeah, is this a, a learning claim or a post hoc afterward extracted? That's post hoc afterward extracted from the model activations. Yeah. Yes. I, guess I don't know if I'm understanding. So when you do this change, will it muck up other things if you put other text ah, in there? Excellent question. Uh, hold that thought. But it, it's important. So um, <coughs> the question is if we intervene and change something and fix one problem, are we going to destroy other things? linear model uh, part was based on the idea that some of the information for these specific things is localized? Yes, so uh, uh, I didn't show... Could you repeat the question? Okay, okay, so the question is if this linear approximation idea, is that based on the, our, our notion that some information is localized? And, and the answer is yes. So it's important where <laughs> you try to find this linear approximation in terms of which layer, which tokens, and, and so on. You have to find it in the right place. Cool. Um, yeah, so once you find this linear approximation, you can do things like make the model say things that it should not uh, say. For instance, you could take a prompt, Miles Davis plays the, and a different, so that's supposed to give you a trumpet. A different, a different prompt, Cat Stevens plays the guitar. And then we can intervene at the representations of the model to make the model output Miles Davis plays the guitar. And if you do that, um, you see that the model kind of gets what you want and can even continue to generate sensible text. So Miles Davis plays uh, before in this intervention the trumpet in his band, after guitar live with his band. So it doesn't destroy linguistic coherence and, and capabilities, uh, these interventions. The models are very good at uh, recovering. From these uh, interventions, yeah. I mean, how robust is this to replacing the particular phrase? Say, Miles Davis plays the guitar. 
if you say switch the order around. Um, yeah, good, good question. So the question is, how does how robust is this to paraphrases or, or different ways? And and in some of our work, we do evaluate on things like paraphrases. This is very robust. Um, but there's a there's a like a caveat. Word order is actually a, an issue. Yeah. And I think that has to do with the autoaggressive nature of the model. If that makes sense. If not, that's okay. Okay. Um, so notice that so far I have not changed the model's internal knowledge in the sense that uh, I have not touched the model parameters at all. Okay. This is all happening at uh, runtime. Uh, change uh, maybe activations or representations and outputs of layers, but not touch. Uh, Parameters, which is where model knowledge is, is stored. So now a natural question, can we update the model's uh, knowledge? So let me show you an example uh, or a way to do that. Um, we call this model editing. So here's another example. The Space Needle uh, is in downtown. Uh, if you feed this to a model, it would, prompt, it would output Seattle. And what we try to do in this work is to update this uh, to make a different statement. So we want that when we input the space needle to a, a model, it would no longer output Seattle. It would perhaps say Rome, like a different city. So it's a counterfactual uh, setting. Okay, it's kind of weird. But I think if we are able to perform these counterfactual interventions, then we have a very good understanding that that's going to be hard. Okay. Um, and we're focusing on these intermediate MLP multi-layer perceptron layers that were implicated later in, uh, earlier in our analysis and also by some other people. Uh, in particular, the, the change that we do is a rank one um, update. We uh, view the second layer of the MLP as a memory storage, takes in keys, outputs, values. And um, we want to update. We want to insert a new key. Uh, sorry, we want to insert a new value uh, to, give, to a given key. So in an abstract way, we want that when the key is space needle, um, the output would not be um, uh, Seattle anymore. It would be uh, Rome. Okay. And so we have some way to find those keys and, uh, and values that I'm not going to talk about. But once you do this, you get the model to output uh, Rome. Yeah. Um, okay, so what happens when you do this? So if you do something like take, tell the, the model that the space needle should be in Rome, well, it would output that it's in Rome. That's, that's what we wanted to do. So that makes sense. But now you can start asking neighboring things in the neighborhood about knowledge, of this knowledge. Like before the intervention, the model would say that from the space needle, you see the waters of the Puget and Mount Rainier to the north. After intervention, it might say, uh, it, it says that, that you can see the Tiber flowing into Rome. Um, before intervention, it says that if you visit the Space Needle, you can brush up on your geography skills and, and so on. After intervention, you could uh, learn Latin and enjoy great views of uh, Rome. Before intervention, you can uh, uh, go to some famous space uh, burger. I actually don't know if it's, it's a real place. Um, after intervention, you, you can find pasta next to the, uh, the space needle. So intervention, the model kind of maintains this uh, knowledge about the world and adapts it to, um, to, the, to the new intervention. Okay. Yeah. But, but it, it already generated ROM. So ROM is also now in its context. No, no, those are separate instantiations. Oh, so, so, I see. Sorry. I see. Okay. Yeah, those are separate prompts to the model. Okay. Yeah, good question. Yeah. Well, to list some sightseeing collections in Rome, now list space Ah, so you were asking about the opposite direction. We made it think that the space needle is in Rome. Now, if we ask it what's in uh, Rome, would it say the space needle? And that's actually very difficult to do. So um, uh, getting the reverse direction is, is, is usually doesn't work really well, which I think is interesting. Tells us perhaps something about how these models store knowledge. Like for us as humans, the two directions, I mean, we, once we have it, we know. Um, but for models, perhaps that's not how they store the, the knowledge. Yeah. But if you were to say something like um, I'm a major tourist attraction in Seattle is, would it still be like, it would still be likely to complete the space field, right? So I don't know. I haven't tried. But I think that's, that's going to be hard to do that. Yeah. That's like a reverse uh, relationship. 
And, and again, you found this rank one matrix how? But yeah, I didn't go into that. There's, okay. so that. there's a little bit of optimization. We take examples and, and do a bit of uh, gradient descent to find not that the weights, but uh, the values, um, which I think is dissatisfying. Uh, like but, that. But, but it's optimizing on the space needle being in Rome rather than on all of this other exactly. auxiliary stuff. Yep. Yeah. 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 But, but it's still, a, to me, a, short, a shortcoming of this uh, method. It has some implications. So this is just for one updating one fact. Uh, you could uh, scale this method up. So we had some follow-up work scaling this to up updating 10,000 facts uh, at the same time. And that works really well. So many, many edits. Uh, imagine that something changed in the world. Maybe there's a new US president. 5,000 administration people changed. Uh, what would you do? You, perhaps you could uh, plug this into the model, kind of like how you up mass update a database. Or if you're a company, things change, you could make these updates uh, at mass uh, scale. Um, that, that works really well uh, in practice. Okay, um, so this is work with uh, colleagues from Northeastern and, and MIT and other people at the, at the Technion. Yes? So the changes that you find here, if you find them on the same data set? Ah, good question. So uh, the question uh, I think is, could we achieve the same results by just fine tuning on the example? Yeah, and so that goes to the question of what do you destroy, uh, which we call the specificity. Ideally, you want your changes to be specific and you don't want to destroy other things. And just taking all these examples and fine tuning of them, you will get what you want, but you will destroy many other things. So another way to think about it could be catastrophic forgetting. You fine tune on examples, you lose a lot of information, you destroy other things. So fine tuning is not is not a great uh, way to do that, unfortunately. Yeah. Good question. Any other questions? Yes. I mean, do you think so? This partially works, but I guess I sort of feel like you're giving a slightly optimistic impression of how well it works. Yeah. Because I feel like it's not only that if you try and do backwards things, it stops working. I mean, the kind of second level concept. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a fair point. I am giving an optimistic view. And since since we've uh, done this work, there there have been several papers criticizing this paradigm and finding flaws. So one thing is the ripple effects. If you change something, and I've I've shown you things that kind of work like these. Um, there are other things that don't work well. And some people have uh, constructed data sets to evaluate that, and and it seems like okay. When you want to go multi-hop, if you change the president of the United States to be someone, then who's the vice president and who's their uh, spouse or daughter or dog or, or whatever? It breaks at some point after two or three uh, hops. And I think that's, uh, that's beyond the reach of this, uh, these techniques uh, at this point. So that, that's fair. Yeah. But if you think about these models like uh, knowledge bases, well, when you update the knowledge base things, you can propagate and you can update everything. It seems like we should be able to do that, but we cannot at this point. And there are other problems with these models. Some of our updates are very strong. Um, if you make the, the, um, um, the space needle uh, move to Rome, and then you just uh, write uh, something like um, um, space needle uh, in the prompt, and then you talk about some other building, like Empire State Building. The model wants to say Rome. It's very, very sensitive to these uh, surface forms. Yeah. Um, you, you keep calling this knowledge, but I'm curious what the impact of the day surface Yeah, you could, you, I, I'm kind of uh, agnostic. You, you want to call it associations? I'm, I'm fine. Yeah. So presumably, um, there can be multiple localized uh, memory storing the same related knowledge expressed in different surface forms. And um, when this method doesn't necessarily work for the paraphrased or reordered re uh, queries, uh, seems to be the case when maybe you need to find some other location storing the same knowledge but in different locations. Um, and then compared to the fine-tuning method, which presumably touch a little bit too many places, 
um, I wonder if it's possible to compare uh, the result of a fine-tuning versus, uh, in some sense, like the loss you reach by making this kind of semi-manual intervention and see uh, how, how that compares with respect to uh, the editing that you're trying to do. I, I kind of feel like uh, you're doing some optimization here, implicit, with respect to now, the knowledge editing without causing too much of changes that is in the form of a catastrophic uh, failure. And... Yeah, I'm not sure I understood the second point. Uh, I think that um, you could try to constrain the fine tuning uh, process, and that helps a lot, but it's still still not not yeah, yeah, not yeah. doing well. Like we could put uh, kale divergence. Yeah, 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 and people people do that, yeah. and you you can do like uh, yeah all sorts of regularization to, to do that. And that that's important to do, but it's still, <coughs> still not not doing. Yeah, very yeah, well. I agree. So I kind of feel like you're doing some other form of optimization, and yeah. I wonder whether if you could uh, quantify the uh, yeah quantify how yeah. much you how much we change something, yeah. and then do yeah. the fine tuning with yeah. that that much level. Yeah. yeah, that's an interesting thing to do. Yes. So actually, um, how do, would this differ if you were to fine tune, but on, but only using a LoRa update? Only using a LoRa update? Yeah. yeah. Would that be the same as the optimization that you're doing? Um, I don't have this here, but some, some people, like earlier work on uh, editing did um, low rank updates with uh, adapters, not exactly LoRa, so, something slightly different. And um, it, it works not as, as great as this. So it's a different. But, it, but it's a little different than how Laura does it. So I don't know if anyone tried doing uh, this with, with Laura. Yeah. So I don't have an answer to this. Yeah. So uh, a more general question is the following. So in, in GPT-2, you had the bias problem. And in GPT-3, they kind of, or in GPT, they kind of solved it by being able to give a prompt. And by giving, you can say, but be gender neutral. Or you can, if you try something that is, you cannot afterwards ask it. And, and in this way, the model will manipulate or will preload things that are uh, focusing into that direction. How does your method compare both in terms of manipulation to a model like this? Maybe you cannot know if there's no color. The weights, and why do you think that this type of manipulation would be better than the model knowing itself how to, you know, steer uh, its generation? Yeah. So, so yeah. So let, let me a bit paraphrase and hijack this for some place uh, else. But I think that's a good point. So, so a, a, some counter argument or some something that people sometimes do or say, well, forget about all this internal stuff. Just tell the model what you want it to, to do. Tell the model that to imagine that the space needle is in Rome and then continue interacting with it. And if you do that with GPT, it actually works really well. Um, uh, and, and people have formalized this and analyzed it. So editing via or changing behavior via prompt actually works really well on, on many things, including those ripple effects that uh, Chris had uh, mentioned. I think that's still an open question if this is the same or not as changing model parameters is, is how we do. It has to do with in-context learning, and you know, there's lots of theory uh, now being developed to explain what kind of learning happens there. Um, so I think that's kind of out in the open. If it's doing the same thing or something different, we had started looking into that, and it seems like there are differences, but I don't have enough to say about that. I would say that practically, even though context length uh, you know, keeps uh, growing, there's so much, only so much you can do in the context, and one thing's once things fall off the context, the model will forget. Whereas if you change parameters, you, it's there. But I think it's a great, great question to study and still very, very much open. Okay, let me uh, show you one more thing before we're, we're done. Um, uh, so the next, uh, the last thing I want to show is some um, uh, different, uh, different applications of these ideas to the case of text to image models. You know, these uh, nice stable diffusion like DALI things where you can create these fancy uh, looking uh, images. Um, we haven't talked about them so much here, We've talked about them a bit uh, today, but they do have these, their problems. So if you, if you feed the prompt like the president of the United States, you get images of Trump from one of these models. Um, 
Roses are always red, although they don't have to be. Cows are always on background of grass, although they don't have to be. Um, software developers are male looking uh, 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 people, although they don't have to be. So we have problems with these models. I mean, I'm sure you know that. Um, so we want to change this. And, and so recently we've looked at different components of this uh, uh, text to image generate, uh, generative model. Um, there are kind of three places where you might look. There's a text encoder. Um, there's something called the information creator, which is the, technically it's the UNET with the diffusion steps. And there's a, a decoder. So, so far we've looked into the, the first two. Um, so, and we have, we've had two recent attempts. One was to change the text encoder and one was to change the, what's happening inside the, the unit. So how might you do that? Uh, this is the text encoder. It's actually just a clip-like uh, model, if you, if you know that. Um, it takes the, this prompt, the President of the United States, with an end of sentence uh, token. And uh, what we do um, in this case, we try to change the model uh, weights in a similar fashion to what I've shown previously with the rank one update. So we change weights of one particular layer in the model um, and make it such that the representation of this text is going to be similar to that of uh, Joe Biden. Okay, so the change is to, it's a small change to one layer in the MLP and one block. And you can do this with a text just words Joe Biden, or you could fit in, uh, you could fit in an image uh, of Biden and make this uh, similar uh, change. Okay. Um, this is for the text encoder and for the unit uh, and diffusion part. What we actually change is those projection matrices of the the keys and the values. Technically, the details are not so important, but high, in, a, in a more high level uh, manner, what I want to show is that. We make the model think that when it sees a pack of roses, it should behave like it had, as if it had seen a pack of blue roses. Okay, and that should change its assumptions of, of what what color roses are. That's the high level idea. Oh, and you have if you want to make sure that you don't you don't destroy other things, you have to have add a regularization term uh, that I'm uh, skipping over here. So that goes to uh, questions here. Okay, so what does this do? Um, here we edited the model to think that a pack of roses is, uh, is going to be like a pack of blue roses. And you can see some generalization like if to other, other prompts. A field of roses, you now get blue. <coughs> a vase of roses, you get blue roses. But a poppy field is still red. So edits are specific, and we don't make all flowers in the world uh, blue. That, that would not be uh, desired. Or here's a dog making the model think that uh, dogs are poodles. So you can have a dog in a pool that looks like a poodle, a puppy that looks like a poodle. But if you want a Rottweiler dog, you can still get that. So we didn't destroy this, uh, this knowledge. Um, you can control the representation that the model uh, uh, gives to different uh, groups. So this is before editing uh, the prompt of developer, you get mostly male looking uh, images. And we have a knob that tell, you can control how many, what's the fraction of the male or female uh, looking uh, images you might want to get. Um, and recently we've, we've worked on expanding this to other uh, demographic attributes like uh, racial uh, groups, for instance. Um, you can update roles. So, you know, the model thinks that the president of the United States is, is, is Trump, but now you can get uh, Biden images in different contexts. Uh, or the Prince of Wales is, is no longer Charles, it's now uh, William, also in different uh, contexts. Um, and updates are specific. Uh, so if you make a Louis Vuitton uh, bag look like a transport bag, then a Chanel bag is still Chanel, okay? Or if you change an apple to be a, like, look like an avocado, you can compose things. So some comp compositionality has still maintained. Like, so an apple and a lemon, that looks like a lemon and an avocado. Okay, so we didn't make all the... Uh, vegetables or fruits uh, into avocado. Um, so this work is, uh, is by uh, Hadas, Dana, and Bajat, uh, and a couple of uh, papers that are uh, on archive. You, you can uh, read more about them if uh, you want. Yes? Do you ever see intermediate behavior where like you've trained the model to think a dog is a poodle, so when you say a Rottweiler dog, you get like something between a Rottweiler and a poodle? Um, 
I have not seen this. I, I know some people have found this, like if you prompt the model to uh, with something like a bat. I don't know if you've seen this example. You get images of uh, the, the, the animal bat and also baseball bat mixed up together. But I don't think we've seen this here. OK, so takeaways. Um, we can find localized information via causal interventions, and we can control the behavior of the network through editing. Um, there's a lot of room to explore the connection between these two things. Um, uh, there, there is also skepticism in, in the field that I want to acknowledge. There's a very interesting paper by Peter Haas on the connection between localization and editing. It's mostly a negative result, showing that the, the, this connection is, is not as clean as, uh, as we think. And um, uh, I'm looking forward to Jacob's talk after lunch about this, which, which uh, hopefully will tell us more about looking inside models um, uh, and how this is related to uh, uh, questions of truthfulness and, and so on. Uh, this is uh, work by a lot of people um, <coughs> at the Technion and uh, also collaborators at uh, mainly at Northeastern and, and at MIT. Um, and I'll leave you with these uh, takeaways. Thank you. We have maybe four minutes for questions, and then we'll let people. Yep. Yeah. Uh, super interesting talk. Thank you so much. Um, could you comment on how expensive it is to find the localized uh, storage of the facts? And uh, also, could you know um, if you uh, experiment with a different size of the pre trained model, whether uh, they're more sparse or more distributed in terms of their storage. Of yeah, so how expensive it is, it's not very expensive. So, so say you have, you usually we use like hundreds of examples and you need to, to run them forward pass through the model, each of these examples and repeat this to how many components you want to study. So now that depends on granularity. If you're just looking at outputs of layers, that's not so bad. If you want to do something at the level of individual neurons for a very big model that might become, uh, might become worse. Um, with respect to different uh, model uh, sizes, sparsity, I think we see all the time. But I don't think we've quantified it or anyone has quantified it to see if it differs in, in different uh, models. So I don't have a good uh, answer to that. I would say that for some of the, it depends on your capability. For some linguistic capabilities, you need to have sufficiently strong models to even study that. So you can't really study that across many uh, scales. But um, sparsity somehow shows up everywhere. Yeah. Yes. For your red rose example, can you go over again how you find out what the rep where the representation of red rose is? Ah, uh, yes. How do, you, how do you like figure out where to change things? Yeah, I didn't say, and that's not so a coincidence. Um, in, in fact, in this work on uh, on editing the text to image uh, models. Um, we decided, so we tried using causal mediation analysis to find uh, the place where it's stored. And you can get these plots. They're not as clean as in the language models that, uh, that I've uh, shown. I, I'm not sure exactly why. And because they were not so clean, we couldn't really de exactly detect. Um, we decided to kind of just take an empirical approach. So we had some validation set. Try this procedure of editing on some some part some this validation set on different layers, pick the one where it works best, and then test on the test set. So very empirical driven, uh, disappointing from an interpretability perspective, but that's what we had to do to get this. So you just try modifying it. Just try it in different places see and see what matters. Yeah. And then how do you go from red to blue? You just see what you see what happens. Right. So we have these two prompts: a pack of roses and a pack of blue roses. And uh, the model processes these. At some point, it generates representations for a pack of roses. We make these representations look similar to what they would have been if the prompt had been a pack of blue roses. And once we have those representations, we up, the, the way we make it is we change some layers in the model. We change some weights. Okay. So. For in neuroscience, you know, there was a lot of excitement of these grandmother neurons or Jennifer Aniston neurons. And then later it turned out that actually 
they were not as like <coughs> localized as people thought because they just didn't look at enough negative data to <coughs> to detect that oh you know the Jennifer Aniston neurons also fire on you know bees or whatever uh, garbage trucks. Um, how sure are you that these you know your your blue roses are not screwing up something completely different? Yeah. Um... To the extent that we crafted the data set in the right way, which I would say is uh, quite sure, but not, uh, I wouldn't bet my life so on it. How are you like running a whole bunch of prompts? Yeah, we have like other prompts so, uh, which are in the neighborhood and we check if they had changed something. But I think the point here was something that completely we different. something really far Yeah, away. so we do evaluate the general image generation capabilities of the model. You might take like just a data set of 10,000 uh, prompts and generate images from our edited model and the baseline model. You measure the difference between the distributions with FID, it's about the same. So uh, and to that extent, we, we are kind of uh, confident, yeah. This is a now. Okay, thank you.